Documate. We are a no-code document automation platform, and we allow people to basically build legal products. I'm also, uh, I guess I'm still a current lawyer because I still pay my bar dues, but um, I don't practice anymore. And some of what we're doing at Document stems from some legal products that we actually built at my old firm. So excited to talk more. That was a great brief introduction. I will also introduce myself briefly. My name is uh, Jared Korea, and I'm a business management consultant for lawyers. I've been doing that for about 15 years. On uh, that time frame, I've probably worked with 4,000 lawyers. Um, and so I'm kind of deep into legal technology as well. I have a software company that I own also, which does website chat for law firms. And I get that one of the great things about being in this industry is that I get to work with really innovative people like Dorna, who's put together a really nice software package here. But we're not going to inundate you with software messaging. We're going to talk about the real deal, as we promised, document assembly for law firm products. So let's start with housekeeping, and I'll, then I'll do a quick agenda. So first off, everyone's muted, as I mentioned before, uh, except for the speakers. Not because I don't want to hear you, but that's to eliminate background noise, and hopefully my children cooperate. I can't guarantee that they will. Um, we've saved about 10 minutes here at the end for a Q&A, and if you have questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. We can make this interactive as well. So um, put a question in. If it's relevant, we'll answer it at the end, um, and also happy to answer questions offline as well. We'll have our contact information at the end of the presentation. Um, if you know someone who wasn't able to make the program today, we are recording it, so the archive will be available. And if you want to watch it again, we'll make the archive available shortly. So be on the lookout for that. Now, today's agenda. I'm going to do a very quick overview of productization in legal, what it means, how to achieve it at a very basic level. Then we want to mix this up so it's not just talking heads the whole time. So it can be a little bit more um, robust than your average webinar, because I know everybody's attending a lot of webinars. Zoom fatigue is real. So after that, I'm going to do a quick interview of Dorna. We're going to talk about trends, pricing options, and ethics considerations for productization. Then Dorna is going to do a quick presentation solo on scoping projects, marketing, and use cases for legal products. Then we're going to do about a five-minute document demo, and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. So as I said, feel free to filter in your questions during the presentation and we'll answer them at the end. So again, thanks for attending today and let's kick it off. I spent a lot of time on Google Images, as you can probably tell. So the first thing, the first question I get from a lot of attorneys now is why is this happening? <laughs> I feel like a lot of people have this notion that like in January, February, 2020, everything changed. And it was like turning a page on a book and it was this instantaneous change that happened that nobody could see coming. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of the trends that are now affecting law firms have been happening for a long time. And if you were watching out for those trends, you could have seen this coming, could have been prepared for it. Some of you maybe already were. So I think the first thing to look at is that the reason legal products are starting to kick up, the reason subscription services are starting to kick up, the reason lawyers are thinking about different models is not necessarily because the pandemic happened. The pandemic accelerated that, but it didn't start it. So what's going on in terms of legal consumers is that law firms are looking for, uh, excuse me, legal consumers are looking for different products from law firms. And that's in part driven by price. So over the course of the last year or so, the convenience economy has really ramped up. Amazon stock has gone through the roof. People have decided they don't need to go to the grocery store because they can order online. And now they're looking at legal services from that same lens. It's a different world for lawyers to be living in. So I'm going to come back to that topic in a second, but let's talk about what a law firm product is. So this is a difficult concept for a lot of folks to wrap their arms around, um, including attorneys. Attorneys have always lived in the world of service provision. So you're writing something for someone. You're doing research on behalf of someone. You're going to court for someone. You're physically and intimately involved in that. And since all commerce, for the most part, has moved online in the last year, it's tough to define what a product is using traditional methodology. So I think The Economist, maybe like 15 years ago, defined a product as like something you could trip over, something tangible, like a shipping box or something. So when you're buying from Amazon, you know you're buying a product. But what does a product look like 
when it comes from a law firm, which houses skilled knowledge workers. It's a different thing. So those examples are a little bit different than what you might consider a traditional product, a widget essentially that you'd be making. So documents are one, which we're going to talk about today. You don't necessarily need to sell the advising services around documents. You have templates that you use that are specific to your practice that are useful for particular use cases. You could sell those directly to attorneys. Another example I've seen attorneys utilizing is a knowledge base, right? So as a lawyer, you have a distinct knowledge of your practice area. So the other thing you could sell to your clients are uh, content, right? You have a content library, you have podcasts, you have videos. You could sell that as a separate product. You could sell that tied into other things. The other thing you could do is add this to distinct service models. So you could have a subscription package, for example, where you're charging clients on a monthly basis like legal tech software companies do, but attached to that certain products that come with the deal. So I think the idea for attorneys when you talk about products is, can you divorce your action from what you're selling? You sell somebody a document, the document's already been produced. You sell somebody content, you've recorded that content in the past. If you're able to divorce yourself from the process, then you're selling a product, not a service. And the advantage of products for legal consumers is that over the course of time, legal consumers continue to put downward pressure on legal fees. It's really hard for people to pay for legal services. They're so much more expensive than other things they pay for in commerce. And I had somebody who I was talking to the other day who said, you know, for a legal consumer, when you ask them to put like a $5,000 retainer down or a $10,000 retainer down for something, that's a lot of money for a lot of people, especially if we're talking about middle-class individuals who need legal services. In some ways, it's like asking them to buy a house without having the ability to get a mortgage. So they're required to pay up front in many cases. And if they can't, then they're dipping into a credit card that has high interest rates, and then they're not going to be able to pay that off in the near term. That's going to be a debt that's going to sit with them for years and years and years. So some consumers in that context will say, you know what, I'm just going to forego legal services because I can't pay for it. So what you're looking at is there's distinct types of legal consumers as well. There are those who are going to want your services, who are going to want your guidance, who are going to be able to pay for it. But then there are also those who are not going to be able to pay for that. And maybe they don't want it. Maybe they just want the document. Maybe they just want information about the legal process. You can sell that to them too. So legal products fit squarely into the new school economy in terms of legal consumers and what they want. Okay, you've heard enough from me. Although I've heard my voice is pleasing. Next, I'm gonna to talk to Dorna a little bit. Dorna, let's hit some hot topics on, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I should have had the, I should have got my microphone, but that's all right. Um, I digress. Let's talk about some hot topics in terms of document assembly and productization. So what trends are you seeing out there right now that practicing attorneys should be aware of that they may not be aware of? Yeah, definitely. I think that two of the biggest trends that we're seeing are one, creating tools that are client facing and that really empower the end user. Because I think historically we've kind of thought the more that we can do for our customers ourselves, our clients, our customers. I've been told that you're supposed to call them customers if they're if they're the they're lawyers like client, product. but client. I, I use the word <laughs> customers because almost every industry outside of legal is going to call them customers. Yes, exactly. Um, so what what we've kind of historically thought is the more that we can do for our clients, the better it is. But really, a lot of consumers, not only for the cost benefits but because they feel more empowered when they use a service themselves and they feel like they're actually contributing to that, to that process and they have control over it, they are really liking these tools that allow them to enter data, allow them to realize how efficient their, their, their lawyer is being because they know that they're using technology. So having some kind of client facing tool, I would put at kind of number one. Um, and then the second thing that I would mention, I think you is, made two good points there. I'll say quickly. One is that like, yeah. some of the pushback I get from lawyers is my clients aren't going to want to do this. They don't want to do the work for me, but you're right in that a lot of times legal consumers don't feel like they have control over the legal process. They don't understand it. And so actually giving them homework in a way that's easy for them to access makes a lot of sense because they can feel empowered. They can feel more control. And I think that's an objection that lawyers make sometimes without having tried products like this. I think there's a 
there's a significant willingness on the part of consumers to do this. So that's a great point that you make, but go ahead. Definitely. And that also goes, goes to pricing because uh, consumers are becoming more and more wary of what, what is my lawyer charging me for and why are they charging me that much? Because I don't really know behind the scenes what's going on. You know, what are they actually spending their time on? Do they have a bunch of templates that they're just charging me a bunch of money for? So when you put technology in their hands, they realize, okay, I know now this is a tech, tech forward firm. So it's not just about creating a legal product, but it's also about positioning your firm in the market in a way that allows you to be seen as tech forward so that they know what, what you're actually spending your time on. I mean, I even, I am now a, a consumer of legal services in certain areas. And when I talk to lawyers, I'm wondering, what are you doing on the back end? You know, if these are, if these are forms, should we be, should, I would like to be part of that process. Yeah, I think that's true. Like the transparency is really helpful. The ability to give people some insight into what's happening and the knowledge of pricing is important too. Like consumer, like a lot of lawyers will say, oh, I charge X amount of money per hour, but consumers don't want to know that. They don't want to know that you charge $400 an hour until the work is done because they start to get scared. They don't know when the work is done. They want to know like, what's the total price for sure. Exactly. Um, this, any any other hot trends you're saying? That well, on that around? topic of pricing, I would say subscription services are kind of having their moment right now. Um, they there are so many more attorneys who are using subscription services to provide their 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 documents, their their hours of legal services, and it ends up being something that can be really scalable for the attorney as well. So I think when I from my old world, I coming from the law firm and going into software. First time I heard the word recurring revenue, I was like, wow, why do people not talk about this more? What a concept. <laughs> this, is, this is such an interesting way to do things. I mean, billable hour, if you're charging a huge billable hour, feels feels amazing when you're when you're using it. But if you can think about, hey, I can put all I can put a ton of work in right now and then see it pay off over time because people will just subscribe to a certain piece of software. Um, that is also really attractive. And so we are seeing many more lawyers doing that, putting forms up on the internet. And I'll go through some of these in, in our example when we get to examples. Um, but that's that's a that's a really popular one. No, totally. It's like there's a lot of lawyers moving in that direction. One of the challenges is like putting rails around that kind of transaction. So I think this is a new thing for a lot of attorneys. So they're trying to figure out, okay, what is the fit for the legal consumer? And then how do I do this in a way that I'm not getting soaked? Because you want to provide value on both ends. It's going to be valuable for the consumer, but it's also going to be valuable for you too, in the sense that like you're not billing at an effective rate of like $35 per hour. Um, exactly. So, yeah, so do you have any tips on that for attorneys, like how they can put rails around these subscription models and actually price in a compelling way without working for less? Because I think that's a challenge. Like when, attorney, and sorry, when attorneys look at hourly billing traditionally, they're like, this is great. I can just extend this forever and just make money. <laughs> like the more inefficient I am, the more hours I can bill, the more money I can make. That's great and all, but consumers at this point are just like, that's not a model we believe in. They've, they've become wise to that. They're so much more aware. Yeah. I mean, even I can say from the time that I was at a law firm from the beginning to the end, I remember we would get no pushback on bills. And towards the end, they're like, why are you not using this? Why are you not using this? I don't want to pay for this. Right, right. So, so that's definitely true. Um, I think having a really clear pricing model is super important. Um, if you're going to, I think what sometimes happens is people get stuck with, I provided a tech tool and then people want some, some form of, of advice. And how much do I charge for that advice and that document review piece? So making it very clear, having things on your website. That's another thing that we don't do as much as lawyers is if you look at any other profession or any other really product that you're purchasing online, you can go, there's a pricing page and it's very clear how much it costs. I don't know if I ever see lawyer websites with, oh, with some so kind rare. of pricing on it. It's so rare. Um, and so having, but, but that kind of clarity is actually good for you as well. Because if you're providing a tech product and then you say for, if I review your documents, it's going to cost this exact amount. Or if I provide you additional hours of service services, I can give you two hours for this dollar amount, five hours for this dollar amount, 10 hours for this dollar amount. 
you're being very clear. And so that allows you to, to really push back on, on the client who's trying to kind of squeeze a little bit more out of, out of you and, um, and, and allow, allow you to make sure that it makes sense for you on, on a pricing level. And I think um, part of this too is that lawyers have to be willing to experiment and lawyers not great at that. Like we're talking about some of the most risk averse people in the world. Like the whole job of a lawyer is to say, well, this awful thing could happen and I found it for you. And when you look at your own business practices and you say that it can stifle innovation. So I think part of this is being willing to test this out. And when I, when I talk to consulting clients of mine, sometimes I say, Hey, you know, you're not going to transfer everybody to a subscription model right away. You're not going to transfer everybody to buying documents right away. So think of it as a beta, as a tech company would do. Run it out, try it, see what happens, iterate. And then you'll, find, you'll figure out a way to make the pricing work. You will. But there's some, there's some experimentation involved. You may take a bath in some cases, but you need to go through that process to figure it out. Definitely. And doing that kind of, I mean, part of that process should be talking to your users because in, a, in any kind of legal matter. And what matter, you mean when you say users is clients. Go ahead. These your clients. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Your clients. <laughs> Asking them what they want to see. What are they not liking about the way that they're consuming legal services? Because they, obviously one of the, the most important thing probably in any kind of legal matter is the outcome. You know, did you win? Did you not win? was the contract that you drafted you know, bulletproof but another aspect of whether or not people are going to come back to you as clients or they're going to refer you to others is how they felt about that process and if you were able to give them a, a process that relieved their fears made it easier for them allowed them to use a smartphone to send you data instead of having to always fill out a PDF form that they have to scan and sign back to you. Um, these are just little things, but they really do contribute to how the, the, the person feels about the legal process and about the services that you've given them as a lawyer. Right. And I think that's swept under the rug a lot because I think a lot of lawyers view it as a zero sum game as well. But like I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, I had a client that I lost the case for when I was practicing. And it was not going to be good for them. And like the next day at my office, I had like cookies. And I was like, who's this from? And it's the person who lost the case. They were just like, hey, you treated us fairly. We thought you did a good job. It wasn't, it wasn't anything you could do. And sometimes that stuff happens too. So while it is often about the result, that's not always the case. And it's like you said, putting together like a package of expectations for the client. So they know what's coming. You lead them down the path. And in many cases, if the result isn't quite what you want it to be, it's not like every client is going to line up to give you a one-star review. That's not going to happen. And the other thing I'll quickly say is um, when I talk to lawyers about launching a new pricing model, a subscription service, documents, like it does help to talk to your clients, as you said, before you do that. So you can talk to five clients, four clients, say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? And maybe they have feedback that changes your mind. And that's okay, too. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about ethics. But before we get there, do you have anything else you want to add on pricing? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you, you kind of touched on was the discomfort of jumping into the deep end and starting with a tech company right off the bat. And I think that one thing that I would recommend is easing your clients into this process. Um, if you're if you're not ready to go full full fledged legal tech product, start introducing some pieces of yep. technology into your process. Like maybe just send out an, a client intake where you gather some basic information. You could automate the documents in house. Then maybe you go a little bit of a step further. You provide certain tools online, uh, and through that process, you're going to learn a lot about your clients. And you're going to learn a lot about what, what makes sense for your practice and your area of law as well. Because I know everyone on this call is probably from many different areas of law and different rules apply. And I think uh, the other piece of this too is like, if you, if you do this, like, I think a lot of lawyers think, okay, I got to do it all or nothing. That's the, that's the attitude for a lot of this. Like, I got to reformat my practice tomorrow or it's not worth it. But going step by step, trying things out, that's okay too. It's very daunting if somebody puts in front of you like an entire cake, but if you can eat it piece by piece, that's probably better for a lot of reasons. Um, all right, let's talk about ethics. 
Nobody likes ethics. <laughs> That's why I put the picture from Psycho on here. <laughs> Everybody's like, uh oh, they're going to talk about ethics. But there's some considerations here in terms of launching law firm products with respect to ethics, specifically about disclaimers. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So I would say there's there's kind of two different considerations. One is, um, you know, just generally, how are you pre- how are you preventing creating an attorney client relationship, assuming that you're building a product that you don't want to build, you don't want to create an attorney client relationship with everyone for. Um, and so there's a little bit of guidance. We have a lot of we, there's a lot of vague vagueness here, but we do have a little bit of guidance um, from the ABA Commission on Ethics and Professional Responsibility. And what they say is that having disclaimers on your website can be sufficient to prevent you from creating that attorney client relationship. And I'll give you the exact language that they use. It's that it has to oh, be, this will be exciting. All right, listen up everybody. I know this is the most exciting part when you quote, quote, ABA com- opinions. <laughs> yeah. um, you have to have a reasonably understandable, properly placed and not misleading warning or disclaimer that the site doesn't provide legal services. So it's generally accepted that uh, that is sufficient as long as you're not acting or communicating in some way to the client that's contrary to that disclaimer. Um, So if you are going to provide these types of services and you don't want to create an attorney-client relationship with each, each different person, particularly if you're in an area, I mean, it's important everywhere, but particularly if you're in an area where you may be getting both people from both sides of the case who, where there could be conflict um, coming and using your site, you really want to make sure you have these disclaimers in place. So like family law is one example where you often have both parties coming onto your site and you want to make sure that, that you're, you're buttoned down there. Well, there's almost always gray areas. And I think that's especially true with legal ethics. And a lot of attorneys would look at that and say, well, that's a problem. I'm not going to do anything at all. But you can operate in gray areas. Attorneys live in gray areas in their practice, Um, which is not to say you don't want to protect yourself. But the other thing I'll add here is I also like click through disclaimers in some cases, because rather than just having a disclaimer on a website, a click through disclaimer means that someone has taken an affirmative action to accept what you're saying. So essentially you lay out a disclaimer, somebody clicks the yes. Now you've got a record of that. You've got an audit trail. And that's really helpful in these things too, because then you're not just relying on, Hey, there's a disclaimer on my website. Plainly, you can see it. Um, You're saying, okay, not only is there a disclaimer on my website, but this person affirmatively agreed to accept these terms. And that could be for creating attorney client privilege. That could be for any other sets of terms you want to add as well. Um, So I think that's an important consideration. And the technology is out there to do that. Definitely. And I'll say, you know, don't be scared off by the ethics rules because companies like LegalZoom certainly aren't. And they're starting to kind of encroach on on this space. But at the same time, they've also created law across the country that enables you to to operate in this arena a little bit more um, risk, not risk-free completely, but, you know, they have fought these battles with state bars across the country. Um, and then there, there are sort of two, not that we want to get too much into ethics, but there are two And with their money, not yours, been. which is great. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but yes, two Rarely exceptions. are people going to come after the little guy. You know, if you're if you're a smaller shop who's, who's doing this, they're going after the legal Zooms of the world. So right, um, right. There's, yeah, but, there's some good law that's been made. made yeah, but there. what were those two main exceptions you want? I was going to say there's, there's two exceptions that they've kind of looked at um in the cases one is the self-help exception so are you creating a tool that's mainly used for people who are engaged in self-representation and the second is the scrivener's exception which allows unlicensed individuals to record information that's provided to another individual without engaging in, in the unauthorized practice of law as long as there's not additional you know, services or express legal judgments that are being made. Right. And that's good to know as well. Yeah. But I think there's this, uh, whenever you're trying to do something innovative as a lawyer and the bar for being innovative as a lawyer is very low, um, (laughs) you're always (laughs) going to be operating in the gray areas in some fashion because there's cultural lag that's happening where this is advancing faster than the ethics boards can keep up with it. 
And then if you look at ethics groups across the country, it's like older attorneys who don't necessarily understand technology well. So this is going to continue to be a challenge. However, what I would say is that whenever anybody mentions the word Scrivener, that gives me the opportunity to say, you should read this great Herman Melville short story called Bartleby the Scrivener. It's fantastic. And Herman Melville wrote other things outside of Moby Dick. On that note, that major digression, Let's do something completely different. Well, not completely different, but somewhat different. Doran's going to talk to you about a few subjects now directly, scoping projects, um, and then two others that I can't recall off the top of my head. Isn't that shameful? Scoping projects, marketing, and use cases. So, see, this is bad. Like when you're running the presentation, you can't look at anything <laughs> else. So I couldn't remember what we're going to talk about, but I'm caught That's up. That's why I was excited you're handling the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dorna, go ahead. I'll go silent for a little bit. All right. Um, so first thing I want to talk about is, you know, I kind of want to talk about the life cycle of building a legal technology product. And that consists, that starts with scoping. So first thing I'll tell you guys is start small, think big, and iterate quickly. So a lot of times people want to build, they have really amazing big ideas for what they want to build. And that's great. That's that's where you want to be as a business owner and, and as someone who's creating something new. But when you're starting out, you want to start with a, a small, narrow scope that you can test with your clients and understand where the pitfalls are and where you need to make changes. So an example of this, um, let's say you're building, you want to build a tool for all of family law so that anything that's in family law can be used through an application. Great long-term ambition, but start with something small. Start with uncontested divorces in a very particular jurisdiction, maybe even in a particular county where you know you can master that, because then you'll be able to test it with your users, figure out what the flaws are, you know, what, what are the, how are you asking questions? Could you be doing that easier? How can you improve the process? Then you can apply that as you expand into, into other jurisdictions, into other areas of law. Um, if you start with the big picture, then like start with a 50 state tool, it's gonna be a lot harder to make changes when you realize that there are things that are difficult for the end user. Um, so that's starting with the scope. And not only when I talk about scope, I don't just mean the area of law or the jurisdiction, but I also mean your user. So you may think that the tool that you're about to build applies to all types of businesses, for example, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large enterprises. But um, you, when you're building your, your tool out, you want to build for one of those audiences because they're all going to have little needs that are different from each other. And I'll actually give you an example from our world at DocuMate. So we, uh, we service mostly law firms and... Um, but we're, what we're focused on is small and mid-sized law firms. We do have larger firms on our platform as well, but we know that we can provide pretty much all the features and tools that small and mid-sized firms want. Whereas the larger firms, sometimes they ask us for different things and they may not be on our priority list. So when you're focusing in on your user and your audience, you can make sure that you can kind of give them the world and you can be the perfect product for them as opposed to spreading yourself thin and trying to trying to cover too big of a market, in which case you may have people who are reaching out to you asking for new features that might not be immediately next on your, on your roadmap. So uh, that's how I would think about kind of scoping and defining the project. Uh, also during your scoping pro during your scoping process, make sure that you're assessing the market. What is the status quo? How are people currently doing things to get that particular service that you're 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 getting you're trying to offer them? Uh, I'm a big fan that just because something exists out there that serves the need, that doesn't mean that there's that you shouldn't also do it, but have a very clear idea of why you're doing it. How are you doing it differently? And what are the benefits that you're providing that other other solutions are not? So that's scoping. And I think we're going to talk about marketing next. Um, part of, so when you're building these types of tools uh, in, in terms of kind of, this goes back to the pricing model as well, is 
think about tools that you're building as being in two potential different buckets. One is lead generating tools, and the second is revenue generating tools. So lead generating tools would potentially be things that you're just providing for free. Uh, maybe you're providing checklists, blog posts, content for your users to access for free and be able to, to understand some basics about the law. Or in the document automation context, you might be providing them really easy documents. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some examples of this a little bit later, but you might be providing them a tool to create really easy document generation for something that's really basic. Uh, that could be your, your lead generating tool that ends up becoming the marketing tool for the future product that you build. Uh, so don't be afraid of, of giving things away for free and, um, and attracting users in that way. Revenue generating tools, obviously that's pretty self-explanatory. That's where you're actually charging for the tool that you're building. So you have a re revenue generating tool. The, one of the hardest steps is getting the word out about your product. Um, and one of the things that I've seen be really successful is, you know, Jared was talking about picking out your user, your, your clients early on and asking them about what they want to see. Those five clients that you asked to be part of the process can be your evangelists once you go to market the tool. So if you've involved them in that process, you've asked them what they want to see you built a product around their needs, then when you go to launch it, they can actually help you promote it as well. And that's, that's, a, that's a really powerful way to get word of mouth to spread, uh, to spread your product. Then after you actually build that tool, you wanna make sure that you're keeping it up to date, you're, you're keeping your credibility high, um, and those are things that you can do directly on the site. So two things I would recommend are um, always making sure that you have some information about what the most recent updates you've made to the software are, because, it, because if someone's coming on and they know that there has been some recent law in this area, they're going to be wondering, does this tool that you've built consider the most recent law? Or is this something just someone just threw up on the internet and never touched again? So if you tell them, you know, this was last updated on April 8th, it considers such and such case, you know, you give them some background somewhere on your site that really increases the buy-in and makes people much more likely to, 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 to purchase. Second thing is um, making your site personable. So we see, um, you know, I think historically, the, the idea has been you take a headshot of yourself in front of like some fancy building and you put that as your, as your law firm picture. What we've been seeing happening more and more is videos and something that shows your personality off a little bit more. So if you put a video on your site, introducing yourself to the, to the client, that is, is a really good way to differentiate yourself from, from other law firms um, and introduce the product that they're about to, they're about to get into. So those are kind of the main ways that I would say uh, you should be marketing your tool. And then let's talk about some use cases. So let's flip to the next slide. Perfect, okay. So this is one of the examples that I was mentioning earlier. Um, this is a, is a firm called Lawvex. And what they've done is they've created this personal property memorandum generator. And they're an estate planning firm. They provide certain, you know, full estate planning services as well. But this personal property memorandum generator is something they put on their website for free. And they have gotten a ton of use from this because people love free stuff. And so um, they, someone will come to the website, use this, and then maybe six months later when they're actually looking for estate planning services, they'll come back to, to Lawvex. It's very similar to um, what a lot of the kind of like M&A firms and corporate law firms do with respect to uh, giving free documents to startups. For example, for example, if, if any of you guys have ever seen Cooley Go, they have a ton of different documents that you can access to generate, you know, employee offer letters and basic fundraising documents. 
they're providing that for you for free as when you're a startup, but what they're expecting is that, you know, a few years from now, when you're either raising a round of funding or you're IPOing, who are you going to think of first? You're going to think of that firm who gave you some free documents and built up that credibility. So good, good example of a lead generating tool. Um, let's go to the next one. This one I love. Um, it goes along with some of what Jared was talking about earlier about just combining the different services that you can be providing to someone. So this also stems out of a law firm. They set up a tech company called Landlord Legal. And what Landlord Legal has is they have the document automation piece. So they're providing all kinds of document automation for landlords. But they also have a knowledge base where you can go search for answers. They have a, uh, an educational site set up on Kajabi. There's a ton of these different uh, sites that you can build courses on now where they teach landlords about some of the legal things that they need to be aware of. And then they also allow you to access um, our services from a lawyer as well. So I love this example because it's, it combines everything. You have legal services if you want, knowledge base, educational resources with videos that walk you through the process and also your documents all in one, one location. Um, Hello Divorce, many of you may have heard of Hello Divorce. They've done a really great job with basically building a turbo tax for divorce law. And um, what I wanted to highlight here is that they have a bunch of different membership options. So they have, uh, they kind of meet you where you are in terms of whether you want to do it all completely on your own or whether you want some handholding. So starting with um, that start, the starter membership, which just gives you some tools to navigate the divorce process a little bit more easily. Then you have the DIY divorce process, which is where you may be you're maybe the type of person who just doesn't want to interact with anyone. So completely DIY, the TurboTax model. And then if you look on the right-hand side, divorce with benefits, which is my favorite name for a, a legal product. Um, that one is, they allow you to have some form of legal services, uh, legal, legal technology, but they also give you a certain number of hours of legal coaching on top of that. So uh, that packaged services where you have tech plus some number of hours of service or tech plus uh, hourly you know, like review of documents. I think that's really effective and it's also a good, good place to dive in to start with um, if, you're, if you're thinking about using some kind of productization. Finally is LCN Legal. So LCN Legal, the reason I throw this one up is because it's a, a lot of the examples we've gone over so far have been consumer focused, or small business focused, but LCN Legal is an example of a firm who's doing this on a massive scale with large customers, accounting firms, you know, very, very sophisticated end users. Um, they do transfer pricing and tax, and they have some very intricate workflows that uh, do all kinds of calculations. They've also, what I find really interesting is they've also translated this into three languages now. So they started with the, an English version. Then they have offices in China and Brazil. So they basically just duplicated those and created a Chinese version and a Portuguese version. So that's another example of how you can start with something and really scale it globally um, through, through the use of, of tech tools. Excellent. All right. I thought those were some really good examples. Um, I am going to I shop, stop muted, sharing Jared, my, oh, unless I'm right. just not hearing you. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? No, no. All right. All right. Dorna, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Maybe it's just my problem. Looks like, uh, okay. Right. looks like everybody can hear me. So Dorna, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Go into the demo. It's all you. I stopped sharing. Right. Sure. Okay, so I'm just doing, gonna do a super quick demo. I don't wanna make this all about a demo, but um, just a super quick demo of what Document looks like in case anyone's curious about how you can actually implement 
and create legal technology on your own. So let me just go ahead and share my screen here. And you should be able to see that now. You're so good. it's basically a two-step process if you want to set something up on Document. So the goal is you're building something that has a client facing interface. And so let me first show you what that looks like. If I click the run button here on my employee offer letter workflow, it's gonna open up in another tab. And I have this workflow. It's a live web, uh, web form. I happen to put a video in mine. You don't have to put a video in yours. Um, I created all these different questions and based on how I answer certain questions, other questions are gonna open up or close up. You have a variety of different fields to choose from. So you can create you know, text, text areas and file uploads and validate for dates. Um, and then everything that you see on the screen here is completely customizable. So you can put your own logo up top, you can do your own fonts and colors and um, even change your layout. You can even add your own custom CSS if you wanted to can be completely white labeled. Uh, but what this, what this does is this is our goal is to allow you to build a tech tool without having to hire a software developer. So this is what the end product would look like. But what I want to show you is how you can actually set this up and how easy it is. So it's a, it's a two tabbed process, questions and output documents. So the first thing you want to do is um, set up all of your questions. And then the second thing you want to do is set up all of your output documents. So the questions are going to be the data that you're gathering from the end user. So you can go to the very bottom, click add question and choose from any of these different question types. And that allows you to create kind of like you would on Google Forms or on Typeform or on you know, something like uh, SurveyMonkey. You can create a form, but then you can add all kinds of complex logic to that form to say, I only want this question to show up if this other question is answered a certain way. So it really lends itself well to the client facing interface and being able to display things on the page for the end user that are, that are gonna be really easy for them. So I'll just give you a quick example of logic. We have a question here that I've set up. All this is customizable. Question seven, what's your marital status? I gave it a, a name, variable name, marital status. And then question eight is what is your spouse's name? So I only wanna ask what's your spouse's name if the marital status is answered married. So what I'll do is I'll go to the logic tab right here on question number eight. And I can say show if marital status is married. And that will mean that certain questions are only shown if they, the person, the end user, whether that's me internally at my firm or whether that's my client, the question eight is only gonna show up if marital status is married. So you can add tons of other pages onto here as well. Um, I wanna show you the second piece of the process, which is the documents piece. So let me go to this document that I, it's just a basic employee offer letter that I have here. Um, what I can do is I can set up all my entire document to be automated exactly how I want it to by setting up all the variables inside of the document. So a few things you can do with your document, set up simple variables. So let's say I want you know, the employee's name to be here. Again, this is all customized. So I, I have a variable called employee name. I can insert the employee's name here. And that basically just gets inserted there like that. Um, when I run this, whatever input I put is going to is going to be listed there. This is a little bit like mail merge. So simple variables are really basic, nothing super fancy that you haven't seen elsewhere. But where you really get power is in logic, calculations and lists. So showing um, creating logic, let's say I want to show this particular paragraph or section of a paragraph, if the marital status is married, and they have more than two children. You can do all that type of logic just by using the side panel here. And so it's super easy to determine whether certain clauses or sections or pages in your document will appear or won't appear. Uh, in addition to that, you can do numerical calculations, add or subtract, divide numbers. 
and date calculations. So add or subtract time from a date or calculate the length of time between two dates. Uh, and then finally, you can set up different lists of items. So if you have a list of children, you might wanna list them out in a table, in a list with commas in between, depending on your grammatical preferences, maybe an Oxford comma in there. So just wanted to quickly illustrate um, all the different options that you have here. So bird's eye view again, set up your questions, create logic to all those questions, set up your documents and you can, you can generate as many documents as a packet as you want and add logic there. Um, and then you're done. You can run your workflow and you have this, this tool that you can actually make client facing, depending on how complex your documents are, you can set something up uh, pretty quickly or spend a lot of time building out um, something more complex. So I'll just put, um, I didn't, I don't want to like focus too much on, on demo in, in this session. So I'll just put a link to our calendar in the chat in case anyone does want a full demo of the, of the product. And we can do that as well. Awesome. All right. We're right on time here today, which always excites me a great deal. Um, all right. So we're through the demo. Now we're open up for questions and answers if folks have those. Um, so now it's time. Ask us anything you want. And um, what I'll do is I'll track back here in a little bit in the presentation. So as I mentioned, if you want to reach out to Dorna, I'm sure she's happy to talk to anybody. Here's her contact information, phone, email, website. Mine's available here if anyone wants to talk to me. And before we end, I should say also that because you were on this webinar, um, you get an exclusive deal through the end of April. You get 10% off of DocuMate. All you have to do is say or type the words, Jared is amazing. Don't forget the exclamation point. Okay. Um, Donna, Dorna, what did you say three I times? Let's say it three times. Yes, Dorna, because I am sharing my screen fully now, I can't see the chat. Do you see the questions in the chat? I don't see any questions yet. I saw, so I saw a couple come in. Maybe I was just misled. Maybe they came maybe. directly to you because I sometimes people message one of the panelists and oh. Oh, I see. Oh, one's from you. Okay, okay. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, I tweaked. I tweaked. My I see one question from yes. Rolanda. Um, yes. I'm saying your name correctly. Are documents on document protect protected? Um, so I can tell you a little bit about uh, data security. We set up all of our clients on their own separate AWS instance. Um, so we take data security very, very seriously. Everything is encrypted in transit and at rest. Um, and if you're curious about more, we have full, we have like a 10, 15 page uh, security documentation document that I can also send you if you're interested, um, if you just email me. And my friend and Steve our, says our, that our, when Pete, when he usually mentions my name, he gets charged more. That's not <laughs> charitable, Steve. Um, <laughs> no, Steve's great. Uh, so uh, how much does document cost is the next question. I'll just put um, in the chat where we have our pricing page on our website and anyone can go check that out. We do have discounts if you have volume based, um, if you have a lot of volume. So reach out to us if what you're seeing is, is not, um, if, you're, if you're looking for like an enterprise solution. And then we've got, uh, I'm gonna, Naliswa, I believe I have your name correct. You've raised your hand, so I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, or you can unmute yourself. Feel free to ask your question, go ahead. All right. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for the presentation. I hope you guys can hear me. Yeah, you're good. Go for it. And thank you. And thanks for coming in. All right. Um, so I have a question in relation to um, creating the products. Like, are there any legal sinkholes that a person might have to watch out, especially when they are curating or creating products that maybe if a client uses them they find that maybe they there's a sinkhole like the document there are legal loopholes does the liability go back to you the creator of the product like i just want you guys to explain any sinkholes that might happen i feel like sinkholes is such a good word for this <laughs> very underutilized uh thanks for your question oh sorry i muted you again dorna fat fingers go ahead 
Um, I was just going to say, so I think the main things you need to kind of watch out for is if you don't want to be creating an attorney client relationship, having those disclaimers and ensuring that you're not providing additional legal services or additional advice based on that person's use case. So you want to make it very clear that you're providing a, a tool online that is very logic based. Um, when you're building out your tools, you may also want to consider some of those those potential pitfalls and scenarios that could come up. So an example of this, um, let's say you're building out a tool for employment law and you're building out a, a tool that generates severance agreements. In most cases, people can probably use your tool and generate severance agreements and give them to their employees and go on with their lives and, and everything will be fine. But as an employment lawyer, you may know that there are a variety of different things uh, in which if you were talking to the client one on one, you would have told them, hey, you need to talk to a lawyer first. Let's have a more in-depth discussion about this. For example, person is part of a protected class and has made tons of HR complaints about that and about being discriminated against. Uh, person is over 40 and maybe you're doing some kind of mass layoff. You know, these are things that could that, that trigger other laws. And so uh, when you're building out your product, I would ask those as questions and potentially kick people out of the process because you want to make sure that the people who are using your product are using it for the use case that you intended and the most limited use case. If they have implications, uh, you know, immigration is another another good example. There could be immigration implications for filing a domestic violence case, for example. Uh, you may want to tell people, hey, you are in a situation where I don't recommend you use this easy online tool. You're in a situation where I recommend you contact our office and get further advice because we should actually form some form, some kind of attorney client relationship there. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a great point. Classification is really important. This is not necessarily a tool for all your clients. It's a tool for a segmented group of your clients. And then the only other thing I would add to that is like, this has to be at the forefront of your mind in the same way that traditional legal services is. So the last thing you want to do is launch this to a website and just let it sit there for years. You can get in actual trouble if you do that. So you want to have a cadence where you're updating your documents on a recurring basis not just based on, oh, I learned this new thing in the CLE and I'm going to change this document. You should review those documents at least on an annual basis that you published online as well. And if you've got a team of attorneys, that should be done as a team. Anybody else got any questions? Oh, wait, oh I was going to say speak now or forever. Hold your peace. We may have another question here. Um, okay. And that actually, let me just jump off of what you said, Jared, in terms yes. of like the team of attorneys. One other thing I'll mention on, on that point is having a succession plan is, is really important if you don't think you're going to be the one who's maintaining your products for the lifetime of the product. Yes. If you think you're leaving your firm, make sure that someone else is going to be able to take over and, and maintain it after you're gone. That's a good point. I, I see we hit all kinds of topics here. Now we're into succession planning. Okay. Um, I got a good question here from Melina. Um, how about courts with respect to document builders? Um, is there feedback from courts on this? Are courts using this? Like, how does this, how does this look to the court system? Broadly? Yes. Um, so we actually work with a lot of court systems. I didn't put that up as one of the use cases, but sometimes I do. Um, we work with a lot of courts who are creating uh, tablet type services for end users or online services. So one example is um, Judge Schlegel out of Louisiana. He's been very uh, public about what he's building, building over there. He's basically taken his entire courtroom online since the pandemic hit. And one of the things he's done is they have an entire page where they have a bunch of different court forms that are built on, on document where people can access those forms and, and generate them easily. So courts are definitely getting into this, this game and they're using it to provide more accessible resources to, to members of the public and making some of those court forms that are really difficult to read and uh, have a lot of crazy Latin language on them a little bit easier for, for the end user. 
Ah, Latin. Okay. Um, that might be a good note to end it on. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else have any other questions? I'll count to maybe five and then we'll wrap this puppy up. Thanks for all the kind comments in the chat. Okay. I think we're done. Dorna, you ready to be done? I'm ready to be done. Perfect. I'm going to take a nap. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, all right, everybody. So contact Dorn if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, if you want to get into Documate and you make that decision before the end of April, you've got your discount opportunity sitting right in front of you. As I mentioned, um, we've got, uh, we'll have this on archive soon. So share it with your friends and family. Well, maybe not your family, maybe your legal colleagues, but we'll talk to everybody soon. Take care. Have a great day. Perfect. Thanks, everyone.